perfect's gold. Perfect, because they won't disappear up your um. <laughs> Thanks so much, oh, I get real. And, and welcome, welcome to another Tonight Live. And, and look, I was only kidding about this running gag thing. You know, if you're watching the show on Friday, you saw me talk about all my fears and how they're being lived out. I mean, we had the space shuttle, there's a nightmare. We had the, we had the guys in the light plane where the pilot goes unconscious and the passengers go, Ugh! You know, had the guys in the window cleaning gantry yesterday. Now another light plane, the pilot's gone, eh, and the passengers have had to try and land it. <laughs> Would you stop living my fears, please? I mean, I know what's going to happen tomorrow. We're going to have man found dead, choked to death by a huge hairy spider that dropped into his mouth while he was sleeping. <laughs> and you always just quietly check your ceiling last thing at night for something the size of a soup plate. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be there, but just in case, you know, I just, you know, now I can sleep. Speaking of death, did you see the guy in, um, he said, linking beautifully. <laughs> See the guy in New York, 480 kilos died in New York. Well, he, I mean, in all of New York, he died. <laughs> it's, it shouldn't really be such a surprise, should it? 480 kilos, I mean, that's a big anything. <laughs> and and he's, he's died and it, I mean, imagine being that big. You'd be worried about so much. You know, you'd be scared of doorways. <laughs> Ooh, the bathtub, look out, look out, it's a Japanese trawler. You know, just... <laughs> <laughs> That whole thing, and getting the body out was a real hassle. They ended up having to put a bobcat in through the window. <laughs> and nowhere to put it, they just sort of kept nudging him and rolled him into the Grand Canyon. <laughs> He's on display. For a while, anyway. And of course, the other thing, well, it's April Fool's Day today. You know, April Fool's Did you guys have April Fool's stuff played on you? Yeah. Yeah, but some of them go, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. Yeah. I think, I don't know, it's a bit of a mongrel of a day, but as a comedian, you've got certain responsibilities. You know, it's a union thing. I've got to get out. I've got to be involved in it. I'm up early. I'm at the doctor's surgery, swapping around x-rays on the files. <laughs> you know, a bit of comedy, a bit of comedy. Into the local vegetarian restaurant, putting meat in the chef's surprise. <laughs> Doing that sort of stuff, getting on the phone to Perth. You know, calling up and going, Rose, it's about the will. April Fool! <laughs> Hey, but wasn't that the best April Fool's gag? I mean, Lord knows, I love a laugh as well as the next person, but Lang, it's been long enough, mate. Out you come. Come on. <laughs> come on, you've played us all a bit of a joke. Yes. I don't know. I must admit, I, I will confess to feel a bit scratchy, you know, the lack of sleep thing. And, and this April Fool's Day has really pushed me close to the edge, you know. Having the whole day filled with people going, look out, look down, look out, ah, look out, it's your undies, it's your undies. <laughs> Quite frankly, by about the hundredth one, I'm starting to get just a little bit sick of it. And they're going, look out, April Fool, April Fool. And I'm going, yeah, look at this, no two front teeth. <laughs> April Fool. <laughs> but maybe that's just me, I'm getting a little stressed. Now look, we're going to a chock-a-block show for you tonight. It is full of goodness and vitamins. In fact, over a third of your daily requirement is contained right in this program, ladies and gentlemen, so don't go anywhere. But first, with the very latest news, here is Jennifer Kite. Yes, hello everyone. With the federal government banning cigarette advertising on sporting fields, advertising agencies are tipping beer and soft drink companies will step in to fill the void. The government says today is the first day in the end of tobacco sponsorship in Australian sport and culture. No new contracts for tobacco sponsorship will now be permitted. All existing contracts to be banned by the end of 1995. The only exemptions, cricket, which will be allowed to retain its links with Benson and Hedges until the conclusion of the 1995-96 season and probably the Adelaide Grand Prix. Motorcycle champion Michael Doohan says his sport will need a similar exemption. 
if we're not allowed to run tobacco advertising, Australia is not going to have a Grand Prix, basically. With the ban to include other forms of promotion as well as sponsorship, the tobacco industry is already talking of a High Court challenge. Knowing the companies as I do, I doubt if they'll take it lying down, and I'd be very surprised if some of the major sports took it lying down either. But Ros Kelly indicated today she wouldn't be budging. Four years is a long enough time for smart sports like them to find alternative sponsors. The Prime Minister has announced that almost 500 Australian troops will be sent to Cambodia, the largest military commitment to Southeast Asia since the Vietnam War. 65 Australian soldiers are already in Cambodia, and their commander, at least, has already been in the firing line. He was wounded by sniper fire. The remaining 430 troops are signallers, experts in communications. And as they loaded their equipment aboard aircraft in Melbourne last night, news came through of continuing ceasefire violations in Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge continues its small-scale battle for influence. Prime Minister Keating says the Aussies are peacekeepers, not peacemakers, and will be withdrawn if things get too hot. Well, it doesn't seem like the sort of thing which happens every day, but another light aircraft passenger has had to deal with his pilot collapsing in mid-flight, this time in Britain. The passenger's mayday call was heard by an instructor flying nearby. The pilot of the single-engine twin-seater had collapsed at the controls. With the two aircraft flying side by side, the instructor gave the stranded passenger an instant flying lesson. Press the top of both rudder pedals together. You'll find the brakes. I can't find the brakes. Don't worry, the emergency vehicles are coming up behind you. Just set in the aircraft, leave the engine running. The passenger is recovering from the shock of his ordeal. Incredible. Well, there's a dark horse leading the race for the United States Democratic Party nomination for president, and it isn't either of the two candidates left in the race. The contenders have begun a series of head-to-head -head television debates, but given the choice of Jerry Brown or Bill Clinton, the voters choose none of the above. And in the British election, voters have been offered some relief from their boredom by the monster-raving Looney Party. Leader Lord Such promises to turn Britain into a tax haven and build several Looneyland amusement parks. Vote for insanity, you know it makes sense. Then there's the Natural Law Party, 300 candidates, all devotees of transcendental meditation. They launched their campaign just two weeks ago, but they're off to a flying start, advocating yogic flying as a cure for Britain's ills. Oh well. The practical jokers and pranksters were in their element today, April Fool's Day of course. Maybe it has something to do with the recession, but many people seem to think we all need a good laugh. How about the rock razor with a built-in amplifier? Its inventor says the link between hair loss and loud music is well known. Just ask Elton John and Peter Garrett. So for the closest shave possible, a razor programmed with your favourite track. A Melbourne advertising agency unveiled plans for the city's VFT project, a very fast tram. Thankfully, the plan to whisk commuters into the city at high speed is only a joke. And that's our news tonight, Richard. Thanks, um, We're going away. When we come back, the top seven, Rabbi Bash, all sorts of stuff. This is live throughout Australia. <laughs> Meet Mimo the stripper. Hey, Mimo, if you took off your clothes, chicks would wipe their feet on your back because they think it was a welcome mat. Acropolis now, right after Family Matters, Thursday. There's just one, and there's no mistake in it one. Hello, Joe. What do you know? Alright, let's sample a bottle. I'll well, make it two. One for you and one for me. <laughs> now we get warm. Diet Coke. Nissan Patrol, power and sophistication that eclipses everything in its class. Unbelievable. It's a Nissan, that's my car. 
Captain Snooze will save you up to 25% on every sofa bed during Sofa Fest. Sofa Fest is a savings feast on a huge range of stylish practical sofa beds. Plus, with every sofa bed sold, the captain will give you a fitted sheet, flat sheet, two pillows, and a pair of pillowcases free. Sofa, the perfect answer when you need an extra bed, get a sofa bed at up to 25% off. The Captain Snooze Sofa Fest for bargain sofa beds plus a bed load of linen free. Captain Snooze, service advice and the right price. <laughs> Oh, plus. <sighs> With 25% less fat and 50% less salt, Badala Double Light is the really healthy natural cheddar. 25% less fat, huh? Now for 100% less mouse. <laughs> Badala Double Light, the healthy way to say cheese. From the outback of Australia, you can see the lights of Paris. From Mount Fuji, you can see the skyscrapers of Manhattan. And from the Kansas heartland, you can see the heart of England. You can see it all on United. Because our wings now span more than half the world. Come fly the airline that's uniting the world. Come fly the friendly skies. The trouble with most toasted mueslis is they're heavy in fat. Kellogg's just right, however, has far less fat than toasted muesli, yet its wholesome blend of whole wheat flakes, rye, juicy sultanas, honey, oats and the goodness of bran gives you a truly satisfying taste without that sinking feeling. Not too heavy, not too light. It's just right from Kellogg's. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back. A little later on, hope to do um, viewer faxes. So if you'd like to send in a viewer fax, here is the number appearing on your screen. Look, that's the one. So dial it up. Send us in a viewer fax about anything. Let us know what you're doing at this very moment. Ugly, really, isn't it? Well, it can be. See what you can do. Speaking of frightening, Count Paul Grabowski in the Groove Matiques, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of the hand gesture thing happening. How's mm. things, Count? Oh, I'm very well, thanks, Richard. How are you? Uh, very well. Now, how's the Mighty TV selling? Oh, As that's in, fantastic. Not your yeah. part-time job, but the album. The album's going very well, thanks. The cutting edge of jazz, it's right out there. Yes, it is. The cutting edge of jazz, it's right out there. Yes? <laughs> yes, I think we can safely say that. Let's move away before I say something we all regret. Tonight's top seven has been prompted by the incredible and somewhat horrific news from America where a lawyer put a cat in a microwave oven, <laughs> kitten cooked, now, we in no way recommend this, in no way. However, we, it, we did behove us to do the top seven comments heard when an American lawyer stuck a cat in the microwave. Number seven, go squealing to animal liberation now, loser. <laughs> a little ugly, I tried to set the scene. Number six, tastes so good to me, can't believe it's skin free. <laughs> oh, good taste has got nothing to do with it. Number five, <laughs> bit visual more than anything. Number four, give me a fire extinguisher, I'm gonna put the cat out. <laughs> it had to be in there somewhere, I think we all knew that. The tension's broken now. These are the top seven comments heard when an American lawyer stuck a cat in the microwave. Number three, the studio wanted a dramatic ending to the fat cat miniseries. <laughs> it's the way the big guy would have wanted to go out. Number two, sign you bastard, sign. <laughs> bit of a lawyer's joke. And finally, the top comment heard when an American lawyer stuck a cat in the microwave. Oh no, what's the steak doing in the cat's bed? I shouldn't have looked up into the lights then, that was a real mistake. Our first guest has just written over 20 books. It's like looking into the reversing lights of a truck. 20 books on subjects as diverse as Judaism, Mexico, sport, sexual trivia. He speaks 12 languages and has traveled to Iceland, Scandinavia, Lake Titicaca, Iran, Jordan, Russia, Machu Picchu, China, and Alaska. And he's here tonight. Please welcome Rabbi Rudolf Brash, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Rabbi, you've sold an enormous amount of books. 
And in fact, your latest book, which is the book of the year, a collection of festivals, we actually couldn't get a copy. You had to bring one in for us because it's sold out. What, what, makes, what makes festivals so appealing to people? Why the big rush, do you think? Because people like to enjoy themselves and to celebrate things. So they want to know what all the celebrations here? I just happen to have the book of the year right here. Now, what made you think up this? What made you think, yeah, this would be a good idea for a book? I'm going to list every festival. Because it's so interesting to find out the origin. Why do we have April Fool's Day, for instance? Why do we have a April Fool's it's Day, good Rabbi? good question. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm on a roll. There are several answers. One says that it goes back to the ancient days of Noah. All for, back to yes, Noah? Yes, Noah. When Noah was in his ark and he got rather fed up and bored. And sure, because it was quite a time not there. not ending at all? Yeah. He sent out a dove, mm -hmm. but it was a fool's errand. The dove came back because there was no dry ground. So the so, dove comes back a bit, a bit miffed said, and it's the first practical And they joke. said, <laughs> that old fool Noah. And thus And later continued. on people thought, after all, Noah was a very decent sort of person, a righteous person. How can you call him an old fool? So they called it an all fool's day because it all is supposed to have happened on April the 1st. You're kidding. I'm I can't kidding. Believe You're right, I'm kidding. I knew, that. Think, I knew that. See, I sense that. I can't believe Noah is a gag master. But the real reason is because New Year's Day used to be celebrated not on January the 1st. Really? But when on, was it celebrated? On April the 1st. No, 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 no. So what are you saying here, Rabbi? No, I'm telling you the truth. And it was only changed in the 16th century, if you want to know the exact date, in the year 1582. Whose calendar was that when they that? was it? Gregory the 13th, Gregory's. the Pope. That figures. Now, what's it, Until, and why did he change it? Okay, why did he change it, Rabbi? You because tell me. Because he felt it's much better. Right, yeah. He just and, said, I don't know, I feel like it changed. But some people couldn't just catch up. They were not with the time. And they didn't know that there was a new New Year. So they still thought that uh, it was a new year. So they went to other people. You sure you're not making this up, Rabbi? No, you're I'm not. Me alone it's the, all the, the humble combat. It's all in the book. Hey, listen, what's, what's and your then all right, do people this. said, you must give me a present. It's New Year's Day. And they were taken in. And that is why it was all fools there. Well, you've got me there. Oh, God. Now, listen, what's your, you've written a book on festivals, so you know about, and it's of all religions from everything from Judaism to all the way through. So what's your favourite one? What's your favourite festival? Every festival. Every but festival. It comes Thank along. you for that answer, Rabbi. That's very diplomatic. And we've got a lot of mileage to go with that one. But don't you have a personal favourite? Don't you have, you know, oof, I'll tell you what, I really no, enjoy I putting like, on the... I like, of course, festivals which are joyous yeah. and not those which are sad. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good general thing. What's a sad festival? A sad festival when you cry. Thank you. <laughs> I just keep walking into these. I just I keep walking into these. Now, you've written, you've written a squillion books, as we said, 20 books. Now, what? 25. Wh 25 now? Right. And, that, and it's only like a couple of minutes since the last intro. <laughs> but how do you find the time to write all your books? You never find time. Oh, I've you walked into another one, haven't I? Oh. Your teacher once said to me, never say in your life to anyone, yes. I have no time. Get up an hour earlier. Teachers always say that sort of stuff to you. What made you listen? I'm always, they're also saying, get a haircut, get a job, you lazy, good-for-nothing fool. That's but, right. you know, but, but no, some stuck... But I found out he was right. Oh, yeah, what a downer. So I guess that can happen. Now, one of the books that got a big reaction was your book, How Sex Began. Now, I have a theory that it's created through a statute, that we're all... It's a legislation thing. We're all creations of the Sex Act. That's and, theory, of yeah, course. Yeah, see, you've got a theory, stuff. and that's not practical. OK, so you wrote the book, How Did Sex Begin? Yes, but that has a subtitle, The Sense and Nonsense of Sexual Customs and Superstitions. Oh, OK, so it's nothing to do with dimming the lights and putting on a George Benson album. Because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, that was a pretty easy way in. You know, it depends on your mind. Now, it was actually a big seller, wasn't it? How, the, how Very it? much so. And you translated it into different languages? I I did and others did, but, you know, into a, Jap per a person. Into Japanese. And How did the Japanese did, react to it? Uh, it was a bestseller. And actually, when I was in Tokyo, I was interviewed. Not by you, you weren't there then. No, the but time. I would have. <laughs> I don't know whether you speak sp Spanish or Japanese. No, no, but I, I anyway, would have. The Spanish would have confused me. But by the though. Japanese playboy. Fortunately, I can't read Japanese, so I couldn't read what they've written about me. But the illustration was sufficient for me. You got interviewed but, by Japanese Playboy. Is this yeah. all a bit unusual for a rabbi to be writing lots of books and Everything interviewed by I Playboy? Do, 
if we are Jews unusual, and uh, the odd thing was, before they translated my book into Japanese, they approached me, the publisher, and said, there's one chapter which is immoral from our point of view. Right, the you Japanese mind? found this was a bit too strong. Yes, and do you yeah. know what it was? Uh, why don't you tell me? <laughs> he said, get himself the out of The origin of the kiss. The origin of the kiss? Because Japanese feel it's not moral to kiss in public. Wow. Not even your child. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? And you know, it's very interesting. Do you know the origin of the kiss? No. What's the origin of the kiss? It goes back to birds. Oh, I knew it was going to go back either to Noah or birds. I was thinking about that. Noah's board is no, on the boat for the ages. They pre-masticated the food. In oh, and their passing being, food off and to the young. And passed it over. And that left in the young a feeling of well-being and happiness. This is spooky stuff. Later on, we've got to get into when lips first came into kissing. Because, you know, that's the bird factor as well. Do Just, you know why you use a cross for a kiss? Why do you use a cross for a kiss? It's originally when you made an oath or any statement, you couldn't write your signature. So what did you make? Just a cross, because it was a sacred sign. Wow. And to affirm that it was true, you kissed it. And that is why eventually the cross became affiliated with and kissing combined and, and eventually identified with the kiss. Rabbi, and you are good at this. We have got to do a trivial pursuit team. We, we are going to dominate. We're going away. When we come back more with Rabbi, we're going to probe desperately and also talk to Nia Peebles as she comes on the show live throughout Australia. This is Tonight Live. <laughs> enormous collection of books, 25 books, Rabbi, from everything from the Eternal Flame, General Sir John Monash, Mexico, how sports, how did sports begin? Do you pick your subjects at random? No, they all have a reason. Well, what about the two cemeteries books? Because that's also origins, the origins of Australia. You enjoy going around the cemeteries, don't you, Rabbi? Uh, not necessarily enjoy it, but I find it. Uh, my wife, who always accompanies me and really is my collaborator... Talk about a fun date. <laughs> I can assure you, we thought it might be morbid, but it was most interesting. Because the things you find, or don't find sometimes... For instance, we heard about a gravestone which said, I told you I was sick. You're kidding. <laughs> the hypochondriac's and, gravestone? And, actually, and we looked for it. We knew even where it was supposed to be. And we found the place. We found three cemeteries but we didn't find the tombstone. And then we found out that the publican of that little village was a good uh, joker, and he told that joke. And eventually people believed it and put it down in books. Unbelievable. And you spent time scouring cemeteries to find this very one. And then, I think I need to say to you a big bridge in Sydney, you know, Rabbi. I've got the feeling I could do that. <laughs> I've got that vibe. Now, uh, actually, you join with us on this because we, we spoke about celebrations and festivals. We've got a birthday in our audience, ladies and gentlemen. Well, not in our audience exactly. Actually, in our team, Mike Grabowski, the, the brother of the Count, the Count himself, Count Mike Grabowski is having a birthday. Where is he? Look, we're up in the control room. We're zooming in. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. Hard at work. Hard at work. <laughs> Mike, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Mike. <laughs> what if, well, there's a special one we all chipped in. Now they're blue, so you can drink them and go drive home. What did the Count give you? What did Count Paul give you? Um, a set of satin sheets. A set of satin sheets. Thank you, Mike Kowalski. Let's pull away from that quickly before he tells us more details. A set of satin sheets. <laughs> You know, the origins of satin sheets? No, but in my book, Mistakes, Misnomers, Misconceptions, I speak about one mistake. You always say many happy returns of the day. And yet? And yet you have only one birthday, the day of your birth. What you should say is many happy returns of the anniversary of your birthday. 
You know, you're exactly right. And that is one of the many mistakes. But the trouble is, on your birthday, you're not really up for a for, you're not really up for a party on your birthday, on your actual birthday. How do you know? Well, I was there at, remember, at Morgan's, but... and let me tell you, he wasn't into it. Uh, I don't know. The, uh, our next guest appeared in three seasons of the hit TV series Fame. She's currently enjoying success internationally with her hit single Street of Dreams from her self-titled album. It comes from, of course. Please welcome Nia Peebles, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Rabbi, Nia, Nia, Rabbi. Thank you. Now, how's things? You're on the promotional treadmill, as we yes, speak. Yes, I am. Definitely. So, you're tired, little puppy, at the moment? Do I look it? No, you look great. Okay. It, 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 agree with me, audience. <laughs> I hear the men. <laughs> yeah, no, that vowel noise. That's their. That's their best response. Now, you were in Fame for three seasons. Yeah. What was that yeah. like? I, I remember reading lots of um, uh, sort of press of the time that said, oh, it was a bit tense, there's a bit of an ego problem between the dancers and the performers. Was it like that? No. No? Was it a <laughs> more a happy family? Because you'd like well, to think it was a team. It's, well, it was a team, but, I mean, and we were a happy family in that we were be being paid a lot of money to play. Mm. I mean, it was a lot of fun. We all had a lot of fun. Um, there's always egos when you get that many people together. Well, that but many performers, I think. It just wasn't, it wasn't as intense as people were talking about, I know. Oh, that's okay. So you enjoyed it. What made you leave eventually after the three seasons? Uh, well, actually, um, after three seasons, I had been, in the last season, I had been offered some films and, and a recording deal, and I was unable to do them mm. because of the show, so I just felt it was time to move on. And uh, that must have been a big call for you to leave a successful TV show. No, not really. I just, it was time to go. Sometimes you know when it's time to go, you just go. And uh, was it hard at all? Were you typecast as a as the person you were from the Fame TV series? Well, luckily, the, the person that I was on the show was a singer, an aspiring singer. Great. So to go into a recording deal was perfect. Yeah, so yeah. it worked well. Yeah. And this, this I should blatantly hold up the gratuitous <laughs> album. Where can we take a shot? There you go. There it is. That's the one you can race out and buy now. Near people's. Are, are you happy with this? This album is fantastic for me. Because a lot of you's in this, isn't it? Yeah, five, you wrote yeah five I co-wrote half of the album and yeah. produced some of the record and I'm thrilled with this one, yeah. Mm. Did you go into the studio with a, uh, you know, a set idea in your mind of what you wanted the album to sound like? No. <laughs> I basically just went in saying, I want to do what I feel. Mm -hmm. And so I, I did some things that were a little unconventional. I took some dance beats, put some rock guitars on top of them and uh, just did what I felt. And what about your writing? How does that come about? Because I know were you busy with the family and things? When do you find the time? And Writing is something that sort of happens along the way every day. Um, you write your feelings down all the time, and sometimes they come out lyrically I don't write correct. my feelings down all the time. Do you write your feelings down all the yes, time? I, well, I'm a woman. <laughs> women always do that, and they really? remember, women remember everything. Yeah. Isn't it true? It's a frightening concept. Yes. Really? My husband, he complains <laughs> about it all no. the time. Not me. Really? So you, you, yeah. uh, you keep a diary? Mm-hmm. How long have you kept a diary for? Since I was 12. Wow. Yeah, so like what, five years ago. Were you going to sell the rights to it one day? Yeah, what was it, five, six years <laughs> you kept it for? Five or six years ago? No. <laughs> so you're going to sell the rights for a TV series to it one no, day? No, 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 you know, no. People's no. the real story. No, 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 no. Put it into music, that's what I do. And what made you, what made you choose Kissing the Wind as the single? Because, by the way, we're going to harass you and get you to sing it. Yes, I figured. Um, I just love the tune. It's got sort of a, um, a different kind of a feel to it. It's a European rock dance thing. It's, a, it's an interesting combination. European rock dance How's thing. How's that? <laughs> That's a big crossover. It should yeah. also be techno. I'm not, I'm not very good at describing my music. I can just sing it. What about uh, live work? Do you do much live work in the States? I haven't yet uh, because I've been busy just promoting the album, which means we do lots of meets and greets where you go, hello, how are you? All this no, sort of stuff, but not, not actually singing. Are, uh -uh. are you looking forward to doing that? I'm dying to. I really am because that's, you know, when you take a seed of an idea and you put it into a song, and you produce it and it goes on to the album and then it goes into a video, the next step is to take it live to the people. Yeah. So I'm dying and to... And see how the response is. Because you worked yeah. a lot on your videos too, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And again, happy with, the, with that side of things? The... Yeah, real happy with the videos, especially the second one. The second one I worked with um, a director by the name of Wayne Mazur, who is a high fashion photographer. So he sees women in a different way. Right. Real is is that where the frock came from? No, 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 no. This, Not this one? This actually looks like a shirt. When the wardrobe lady walked in with us, it was hanging on a thing, and I said, 
where's the rest of it? She said, no, this it was only quiet. about this big. She said, that's your dress. That's how big you are, Nia. I went, okay. Okay, sure. I, I, I can live with that. Well, sit there and, and gather your strength because we're actually going to get you to sing for us in just a sec. We're going away. When we come back, yes, Nia will sing. Rabbi will talk and we'll do viewer faxes. <laughs> Is Australia ready to see this? Lie back and get comfortable. We dare you to watch the most controversial program ever screened in this country. I'd whip you a little bit. From the talkback fantasy show... You know my mother watches me. ...to the 300-pound man who thinks he's Madonna. You have a problem with men wearing women's clothing? This is sex. Let's play. Oddballs. I enjoy a lot of body contact. And videotape. It's sex. It's a scandal. 8.30 Thursday, anything can happen. And I mean anything. <laughs> Welcome back. Look, this is what you're looking for to race out and buy. There you go, the self-titled album, Neo Peebles. And performing her new single... Oh, sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry. Back there. Performing her new single, Kissing the Wind. Please welcome Neo Peebles, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Take a seat. Oh, that was terrific, Nia. Pull up a chair. 
Now, now we've got something that we like to call viewer faxes, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dear Richard, can you ask Count Paul to recommend a good razor? I want a face as smooth as a baby's bottom, just like Paul's. That's from Jason Rumble. Can we see the, the in fact count? Ah, oh, there it is. Yes, indeed, I can. Now, is this a three-day growth count? I've always wanted to ask. This one is about a, yeah, be about a two-day growth, this one, Richard. I think you're just bragging. I think you're just trying to hurt me. because The you know, old I hormone the tablets problem. are really working for me. Okay, sure. A couple of us shave once, twice a week, even though we don't need to. <laughs> Next wish. one, uh, this is from Shaman Sheet Metal. Dear Richard... Uh, Darren? Darren Baker, is he here? Darren Baker? Darren, my name's Darren Baker. I'll be in the audience tonight with three mates, Jason, John and Paul. How oh, ugly. What, you wanted to say hello to your girlfriend? You're, you're in from Adelaide, eh? And yep. you wanted to say hi to your girlfriend? Yep. Siobhan. Well, quick, do it. Hello, Siobhan. How are you? <laughs> you romantic guy. <laughs> you romantic guy. Wow, months away. And what do you get? Hello, Siobhan. How are you? <laughs> uh, here we go. What's big and white and sits in the corner? A naughty fridge. Thank you very much. Someone's up very late at night and drinking wine. Richard, why do you always wear black? What is it? Some sort of trademark? We love it. No, it's actually to match my eyes. Thank you very much. And finally, I realise you don't have many good opportunities. The Melbourne High School Senior Social, Year 11 and 12. We can even let you in for free, Richard. Don't tell your wife because you might pick up someone. Uh, yeah, right. I don't think I'm the right person to go to a Year 11 dance. Thanks all the same. Not since the incident the other night. Oh, never mind. Uh, we're going away. That was Viewer Faxes, ladies and gentlemen. When we come back, Tracy Hutchins and all that sort of stuff. Actually, yes, when we come back, we'll go away. Go away now, come back later. Welcome back. Our next guest began her career in radio while studying media in Sydney. She wrote this book, look, this is something, your name's on the door, which is based on Australian bands and pop personalities of the 80s, a frightening concept. She's with us tonight. Please welcome Tracy Hutchison, ladies and gentlemen. Tracy, Rabbi, Nia. Did you all meet? <laughs> yes, it sounds like one name. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't it? Tracy, Tracy Rabbi Nia. <laughs> now, where did, um, uh, where, how did the book come about? Your name's, you, the title's great, by the way, your name's on the door. Well, I thought, you know, if you're going to write a book about rock and roll, you've got to pick a title that um, is really going to tap into people. And I think if anyone's ever been to a live show, they've, um, they've stood in a queue and had some person come up and push in and say, oh, you know, my name's, name's on, on the door, the, you know, goes, uh, and it means basically you've got your name on for free because you know someone who that's knows right. someone. You've got to do a follow-up book where, you know, it's okay, I'm with the band. Yeah, or something like that, or I'm, you know, a friend of the hairdresser or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, basically, it's a collection of quotes and interviews from... Yeah, it's actually based on a radio series that I did when I was working for um, the ABC's radio youth network, Triple J. And I'd sort of <laughs> come to the end of it and thought, I've got this amazing collection of stories, because usually whenever you talk to an artist, they only want to talk about what they're doing now mm. and tomorrow. They're not really yeah. interested in talking about what they were doing 10 years ago. I always thought it was just a memory and attention span thing, but do you think it's a deliberate thing? <laughs> I just think it's something that, unless you're sort of having a nervous breakdown or something, you don't actually think about what you've done for the last 10 years of your <laughs> life. And it was a really rare opportunity, I think, for not only me to be able to find out about some of those stories, like Barnsley in the Chisel days and Nick Cave in the birthday party days, and just stories that people don't tell. And in a way that was also for the artists, I think they were actually also putting their own career in a bit of perspective as well. So it just seemed a really nice thing. And, and the 80s was a... It'll be remembered as the decade that really saw the Australian music um, industry come of age, you know, Yeah, I guess it will. I was trying to think what, what was musically significant about the 80s. I mean, in the 70s we had, you know, sort of disco and, and large collars, and I think they're two yeah. important things to stay with us. But I guess in the 80s, what, <laughs> shoulder pads and what, what musically would you say? Well, it really was the decade that put Australian music on the map internationally. Yeah, but marketing more than the music, don't you think? Um, Australian... Australian music marketing came of age in the 80s. Well, yeah, and, but that was born out of a whole lot of things. It was born out of the fact that we were producing music that was being recognised um, 
in an international scale. Mm. And so all of a sudden the infrastructure followed. You know, all of a sudden there was the radio that was thinking, wow, we should start playing Australian And there songs. were managers who were going, wow, yeah. we can make money. Yeah. yeah, and so it sort of turned into a, a whole thing and, and that really happened during the 80s. And it was also the decade that um, really politicised Australian music. I well, think. yes and no. I mean, it was also the rise of uh, the Kylie Jason Michael triangle, and yes. which you cover in the book. That must have been an exciting time for you, Trace. Oh, yes, Richard, that was one of the highlights of the book, let me <laughs> tell Nick you. After Nick Cave and the birthday party swing straight into early, <laughs> so Charlene out of Neighbours, Kylie, that's a game. Well, you know, for a while there, you know, if you had a lead in a soap opera, you were guaranteed on getting a record deal, much to the chagrin of a lot of people who were fighting for them. But, um, I mean, the thing about Kylie and Michael that was so fantastic toward the end of the decade was that we'd had this, this great era, you know, this, I think it will be remembered quite fondly, the 80s. And then all of a sudden, at the end, we had a king and queen of pop again. Again. Not since, you know, Alison Durbin and Johnny Farnham did we have. What a lovely double to, yes. to conjure up, Alison well, was, Durbin and Johnny Farnham. Well, it was fantastic, you know, and there they were. And she'd sort of gone from being this, you know, singing bubblegum budgie into Australia's own version of what Madonna. What I thought was hilarious is that, is that Kylie was always like, oh, no talent, no talent. And, and then all of a sudden she goes out with Michael and lots of groovy people yeah. are trying to be in her band. Absolutely. Excuse me, can I play in your band? Please? Absolutely. Like people who were really um, stalwart, non-mainstream musicians were, when, when Kylie went on the road at the end of the 80s, they were just falling over themselves to be in her backing band. It's like, you're playing, oh, fine. Yeah, it's groovy now, it's groovy. <laughs> yeah, so are flares, but I don't wear them. <laughs> yeah. Now, the book is Your Name's on the Door. Have you had reactions from some of the people, like Jenny Morris, for example, who's, who's mm. in the book? Have you had reactions back from anyone? Um, I actually haven't sort of, you know, the book's only been out for a week or two You've now. You've kept a low profile, haven't you, Trace? Well, you know, I mean, sometimes the ABC likes to keep things a big secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, by and large, though, the people who've seen it have, have responded really well. And a lot of them, I mean, actually, one of the people in there was, was flicking through and kind of looked at me. And uh, I was actually getting really nervous because it was the first time, you know, someone was looking at it in yeah. front of me. And I'm thinking, oh, God, this is it, the moment of truth. They're going to punch me out. They're going to punch me out. And it was just like, I can't believe it. And I thought, all oh, right, OK, I've misquoted them. I mean, and it was, this is the first time I've actually seen myself quote exactly what I said and I thought... Oh really? You did that? <gasps> yeah, I did. That's going to ruin the industry as we know it, quite <laughs> frankly. Our, our special comedy act tonight is here for the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. They're a frightening group of young lads who needed a home and a job and they've sort of found it. Please welcome, ladies and gentlemen, The Found Objects! <laughs> introduce you to a couple of friends of mine all the way from SeaWorld, the only known albino dolphins in captivity. Here they come now. <laughs> oh wow, they're so beautiful. Aren't they lovely? Don't you just love dolphins? Ah. Oh. We believe in love, we believe in truth, we eat fish but we respect them, <laughs> surfers out too far, swimmers in trouble, we're always there to protect them, grab our fin for a while, we'll bring each creature a mean to a smile, we are, we are the hippies of the sea, the hippies of the sea. Actually, I just want to test something. You know, remember Flipper and Butt had that really neat thing that he stuck under the water and went, I just want to see if that really works. Go away, dolphins. It really works. I always thought that was bullshit. <laughs> We're smarter than you. We're beautiful too. We're amazing acrobats. Double back somersault, triple twist, um, in pike, piece of piss. <laughs> We're tougher than sharks and cuter than whales. You must admit you're pretty impressed by that. We scare ourselves sometimes. We are, we are the hippies of the sea. 
the hippies of the sea. Hey, Dolphin, do you reckon you could, you could dance like Sidney Portier in To Sir With Love? Sidney who? Sidney Portier. You know, at the end of uh, To Sir With Love, he dances. Oh, yeah. Remember, see if you can dance like that. Beards. We, we can't drive a combi because we haven't got hands or feet. We can't burn incense underwater. Uh, but without a care in the world, we can swim without a care in the world. We can swim without a care in the world. We can swim in the nude. In the nude. Look, these are books you can go out and buy. Look, well, this one you can't. This is the Rabbi Brashes and it's in its third printing. But if you wanted to know anything about festivals, that was the one to tell you. And look, this one will tell you all about the 80s and what it was like to be in an Australian band. Don't worry, your name's on the door. Uh, and oh, oh, while we're plugging things gratuitously, here, here's the record to buy. Nia hasn't written a book, but she's read many. And I, I think that's the link. Now, Jen, speak of reading. Front pages? Yes, we have. Uh, the West Australian tomorrow has an interesting story. It's still going on about the Lang Hancock saga. Now, what they're saying, uh, Rose Hancock and her stepdaughter, Gina Reinhardt, are squabbling again, not over the will, but over Lang's body. Oh. State morgue still has the body because it doesn't know who to release it to. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is quite serious. Apparently, mm. they've made oh, separate is. funeral arrangements. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm not good in this area, but maybe if they each grabbed an ankle, pulled and made a wish. <laughs> just, just as a thought, I, I don't know. But... You know, a bit, of, a bit of a Solomon thing there, you know, just down the middle there, Rabbi, you can relate. Just about time for us to leave, especially now that the Hancock clan are gunning for us. We'll be back tomorrow, though. This has been live throughout Australia. We'll see you tomorrow night when... David Burnham.